Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to this video series on Windows Server 2016 Unicast. Here we start to get into the heart of how NLB distributes packets among the different hosts. Since we don't have a physical load balancer that is receiving the traffic first and then deciding where to send it, how do the load balance servers decide who gets to take which packet streams? The answer to answer that question, we need to back up a little and discuss how traffic really flows around inside your network when you open up a web browser on your computer and visit HTTP web one DNS resolves that IP address to 10.0.0.40. For example, when the traffic hits your switches and needs to be directed somewhere, the switches need to decide where the 10.0.0.40 traffic needs to go. You might be familiar with the idea of MAC addresses. Each NIC has a MAC address and when you assign an IP address to an NIC, it registers its own MAC address and IP with the networking equipment. These MAC addresses are stored inside an ARP, an ARP table, which is a table that resides inside most switches, routers, and firewalls. When my Web1 server was assigned the 10.0.0.40 IP address, it registered its MAC address corresponding to 10.0.0.40. When traffic needs to flow to web one, the switches realize that traffic destined for 10.0.0.40 needs to go to that NIC's particular MAC address and shoots it off accordingly. So in the NLB world, when you are sending traffic to a single IP address that is split between multiple NICs, how does that get processed at the MAC level? The answer with Unicast NLB is that the physical NIC's MAC addresses get replaced with a virtual MAC address. And this MAC is assigned to all of the NICs within the NLB array. This causes packets flowing to that MAC address to be, to be delivered to all of the NICs, therefore all of the servers in that array. If you think that sounds like a lot of unnecessary network traffic is moving around the switches, you would be correct. The best part about Unicast is that it works without having to make any special configurations on the switches or networking equipment in most cases. You set up the NLB config and it handles the rest. The downsides to Unicast are that because the MAC address exists on all nodes, it does cause some intranode communications problems. In other words, the servers that are enabled for NLB will have trouble communicating with each other's IP addresses. If you really need uh, those web servers to be able to talk with each other consistently and reliable, the easiest solution is to install a separate NIC on each of those servers and use that NIC for those intra-array communications while leaving the primary NICs configured for NLB traffic. The other downside to Unicast is that it can create some uncontrollable switch flooding. The switches are unable to learn a permanent route from the virtual MAC addresses because we need it to be delivered to all of the nodes in our array since every packet moving to the virtual MAC is being sent down all avenues, sorry, all avenues of a switch so that it can hit all of the NICs where it needs to be delivered. It has the potential to overwhelm the switches. If you are concerned about that, or having complaints from your networking guys about switch flooding, you might want to check out one of the multicast modes for your NLB cluster. Multicast, choosing multicast as your NLB mode comes with some upsides and some headaches. 
The positive is that it adds an extra MAC address to each NIC. Every NLB member then has two MAC addresses, the original and the one created by the NLB mechanism. This gives the switches and networking equipment an easier job with learning the routes and sending traffic to its correct destinations without an overwhelming packet flood. In order to do this, you need to tell the switches which MAC addresses need to receive this NLB traffic. Otherwise, you will cause switch flooding just like with Unicast. Telling the switches which Macs need to be contacted is done by logging into your switches and creating some static ARP entries to accommodate this. If you're not familiar with modifying ARP, ARP tables and adding static routes, it can be a bit of a nuisance to get right. In the end, multicast is generally better than unicast, but it can be more of an administrative headache. My personal preference still tends to be unicast, especially in the smaller business. Um, I have seen it used in many different networks without any issues. And going with unicast means we can leave the switch programming alone. Multicast IGMP, better yet, but not always an option, is multicast with internet group membership protocol IGMP. Multicast IGMP really helps to mitigate switch flooding, but it only works if your switches support HGMP snooping. This means that the switch has the capability to look inside multicast packets in order to determine where exactly they should go. So where unicast creates some amount of switch flooding by design, multicast can help to lower that amount and IGP can bake that down even smaller. The NLB mode that you choose will depend quite a bit upon the capabilities of your networking equipment. If your servers have only a single NIC, try to use multicast or you will have intra-array problems. On the other hand, if your switches and routers don't support multicast, you don't have a choice a unicast will be your only option for configuring Windows network load balancing. Configuring a load balanced website. Enough talk. It's time to um, set this up for ourselves and give it a try. I have two web servers running on my network lab, Web1, Web2. They both use IIS to host an intranet website. My goal is to provide my users with a single DNS record for them to communicate with, but have all of the traffic split between the two servers with some real load balancing. Follow along for the steps on making this possible. Enabling NLB. First thing, we need to make sure that Web 1 and Web 2 are prepared to do network load balancing. Because it is not installed by default, NLB is a feature available in Windows Server 2016. And you add it just like any other role or feature by running through the add role features wizard. Add this feature on all of the servers that you want to be part of the NLB array. Enabling MAC address spoofing on VMs. Remember when we talked about unicast NLB and how the physical MAC address of the NIC gets replaced with a virtual MAC address that is used for NLB array communications. Yay. Virtual machines don't like that. If you are load balancing physical servers with physical NICs, you can skip over the section. But many of you will be running web servers that are VMs, whether they are hosted with Hyper-V, VMware or some other virtualization technology. There is an extra option in the configuration of the virtual machine itself that you will have to make so that your VM will happily comply with this MAC address dressing change. The name of this setting will be something along the lines of enable MAC address spoofing though 
the specific name of the function could be different depending on what virtualization technology you use. The setting should be a simple checkbox that you have to enable in order to make Mac spoofing work properly. Make sure to do this for all of your virtual machines on which you will install NLB. The VM needs to be shut down in order to make this change. So I have now shut down my web one and web two servers. Now find the checkbox and enable it. Since everything that I use is based on Microsoft technology, I am of course using Hyper-V as the platform for my virtual machines here in the lab. Within Hyper-V, if I right click on my web one server, and head into the VM settings, I can then click on my network adapter to see the various pieces that are changeable on web one's virtual NIC. And there it is my enable spoofing of Mac address uh, checkbox. Simply click on that to enable and you're all set. If enabling a spoofed MAC address is grayed out, remember that the virtual machine must be completely shut down before the option appears. Shut it down, then open up the settings and take another look. This option should now be available to choose configuring NLB. Let's summarize where we are at this point. I have two web servers, web one and web two, and they each currently have a single IP address. Each server has IIS installed which is hosting a single website. I have enabled MAC address spoofing on each and I just finished installing the network load balancing feature onto each web server. We now have all of the parts and pieces in place to be able to configure NLB and get that web traffic split between both servers. I will be working from web one for the actual configuration of network load balancing, log into this and you will notice that we have a new tool in the list of tools that are available inside server manager called network load balancing manager. Go ahead, open up that console. Once you have the NLB manager open, right click on network load balancing clusters and choose new cluster. When you create a new cluster, it is important to note that currently there are zero machines in this cluster. Even the server where we are running this console is not automatically added to the cluster and we must remember to manually place it into this screen. So first I'm going to type in the name of my web one server and click on connect. After doing that, the NLB manager will query web one for NICs and will give me a list of available NICs upon which I could potentially set up an NLB. Since I have one NIC on this server, I simply leave it selected and click on next. The following screen gives you the opportunity to input additional IP addresses on web one. But since we are only running one IP address, I will leave this screen as is and click on the next again. Now we have moved onto a window asking us to input cluster IP addresses. These are the virtual IP addresses, VIPs, that we intend to use to communicate with this NLB cluster. As we stated earlier, my VIP for this website is going to be 10.0.0.42. So I click on the add button and input that IPv4 address along with its corresponding subnet mask. One more click on the next button and we can now see our option for which cluster operation mode we want to run depending on your network configuration choose accordingly between unicast multicast and igmp multicast the following screen of our nlb wizard allows you to configure port rules by default there is a single rule that tells nlb to load balance any traffic coming in on any port but you 
can change this if you so desire. I don't see a lot of people in the field specifying rules here to distribute specific ports to specific destinations. But one neat feature in this screen is the ability to disable certain ranges of ports. This piece could be very useful if you want to block unnecessary traffic at the NLB layer. Finish up that wizard and you've now created an LNB cluster. However, at this point in time, we have only specified information about the VIP and about the Web1 server. We have not established anything at all about Web2. Go ahead, right click on the new cluster and select add host to cluster. Input the name of our Web2 server. Click on connect and we walk through the wizard in order to add the secondary NLB node of Web2 into the cluster. Once both the nodes are added to the cluster, our network load balancing array or cluster is online and ready to use. If you take a look inside the NIC properties of our web servers and click on the advanced button inside TCP IPv4 properties, you can see that our new cluster IP address of 10.0.0.42 has been added to the NICs. The traffic that is destined for the 10.0.0.42 IP address is now starting to split between the two nodes. But right now, the websites that are running on Web 1 and Web 2 servers are configured to only be running on the dedicated 10.0.0.40 and 10.0.0.41 IP addresses. So we need to make sure and adjust that next. Configuring IIS and DNS, just a quick step within IIS on each of our web servers should get the website responding on the appropriate IP address. Now that the NLB configuration has been established and we confirmed that the new 10.0.0.42 VIP address has been added to the NICs, we can use that IP address as a website binding, open up the IIS management console and expand the sites folder so you can see the properties of your website. Right click on the site name and choose edit bindings. Once inside um, site bindings, choose the binding that you want to manipulate and click on the edit button. This intranet website is just a simple HTTP site. So I'm going to choose my HTTP binding for this change. The binding is currently set to 10.0.0.40 on web one and 10.0.0.41 on web two. This means that the website is only responding to traffic that comes in those IP addresses. All I have to do is change that IP address drop down to the new VIP, which is 10.0.0.42. After making this change and clicking on OK, the website is immediately responding to traffic coming in from the 10.0.0.42 IP address. Now we come to the last piece of the puzzle, DNS. Remember, we want our users to have the ability to simply enter HTTP intranet into their web browsers in order to browse this new NLB website. So we need to configure a DNS host a record currently. That process is exactly the same as any other DNS host record. Simply create one and point intranet contoso.local to 10.0.0.42. Test it out, NLB configured, IIS changed over check, DNS record cheated. Sorry, DNS record created check. We are ready to test this thing out. And if I open up the web browser on a client computer and browse to HTTP um, intranet, I can see the website. But how can we determine the load balancing is really working? 
if I continue refreshing the page or browse from another client, I continue accessing HTTP intranet and eventually the MLB mechanism will decide that a new request should be sent over to web two instead of web one. When this happens, I am presented with this page instead. As you can see, I modified the content between web one and web two so that could, so I could distinguish between the different nodes just for the purpose of this test. If this were a real production internet website, I would want to make sure that the content of both sides of both sites was exactly the same so that users were completely unaware of the MLB even happening. All they need to know is that the website is going to be available and working all of the time. So I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like, sharing and subscribing. Thank you.